simple, simple message today. I want to talk about the battle within. The battle within. You know, as human beings, each and every one of us, there are certain common experiences that we have. It's not so. I mean, I don't know but, but about you, but every one of us almost, you don't want to have a time change anymore, do you? <laughs> this adjustment is bad. It, it takes such a long time to get over it. And I guess when you get older, it's even harder, unless you're retired. <coughs> it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Sunday can fall on Monday for all you care, right? <laughs> um, but we all have these times we go through periods of happiness, we experience sadness, we experience disappointment, and then physically we're tired, or we're hungry, or we're sick, things like that. So we have these common experiences, but today I want to talk about um, a struggle that each and every one of us would face. Um, a battle that we face, and, and we have to fight for ourselves. And we can either win or lose this battle. Now, it's not something that we hear a lot in the church, but it's so pivotal, it is so important. And what I love about the Sunday mornings now is that because of our ongoing Bible study, I can begin to touch on some things that are, you know, quite a variety rather than having to be focused on some, you know, like a, going through a book in the Bible and stuff like that. The outcome of this battle um, depends upon you, the individual. It is not your mom, not your dad, not your pastor, not the prime minister, not the president, anyone. It doesn't depend upon the church you attend. It doesn't depend upon which country you're in, the race, the color of your skin, the level of your education. The outcome of this battle depends upon you. In fact, the outcome of this battle really is like a pass or fail exam. And it tells you the condition of your heart. You know what's most important to God? Dressing how you dress, how you look is important. How clean you are is important. You know, stuff like that. But what's more important is your heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And this battle is ours to win or to lose. It is the battle within, and the best of us would face this battle. In fact, there is a man in the Bible who would probably I'll mention his name to you. He's the most godly man probably who ever lived. We don't consider Jesus in this category we're talking here. Jesus is above everyone else. In fact, this man is such a legend that, well, he wrote about half the books in the New Testament. And this is what he had to say. Paul, for I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want. But I do the very thing I hate. Paul is saying this. He says again. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Then he says again, the desire, for I do not do the good I want. But the evil that I do not want is what I keep on doing. So here is a man, a godly man, and this battle is raging within him. He's lamenting, he's bemoaning, he's agonizing over the struggle within, over the battle within, the battle in his inner man. So what is that battle? It is the battle of the flesh versus the spirit. And he elaborates on this subject in the book of Galatians, and that's where we'll take our text from this morning. So as we read this text, I want us to look at how he identifies the opponents, how he reveals their manifestations, and he gives us also the key to winning the battle. Now, as Christians, we need to understand this, that we've got four big enemies in our lives. And I don't know if I probably want to call this a mini-series on my, our common enemy. Number one, it's Satan. Satan. Number two, 
It's the world system. The world system. John says love, not the world. The third one is the flesh. The flesh, which we're going to be talking about today. And number four, it's self. Self. And we've got to understand these enemies. We've got to be able to identify these enemies when they're operating in our lives. So Paul says this in Galatians 5.16. Can we all read together, please? But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify or satisfy the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. Paul is not denying that you want to do these things. You want to do some things. But there's something fighting inside of you. He says this. But if you are led by the spirit. You are not under the law. Let's continue. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality. Impurity. Sensuality. Come on idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. <coughs> I notice you kind of dwindled down there, so I'm going to go back to verse number 22. Let's all read together, please. Come on. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires if we live by the spirit let us also keep in step with the spirit fathers we <clears throat> come into your house today and we sit at your feet Lord Jesus I ask that you would minister to us through your word the Holy Spirit bring enlightenment to us. The Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. The Holy Spirit bring revelation to us today in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> so, as we are looking into the scriptures today, the task ahead for us is that we will become more aware of this battle. That's what I want us to do today. Become more aware of this battle. You see, many times we attribute our problems to other people. It's my wife. It's my husband. My brother, my sister, my children, my parents, my cousins, my relatives, my boss, my workmates, my church. Not realizing that it is my problem. And some people probably tell you, you've got a problem. It's my fault, it's my error, it's my weakness, it's my decision. Many times, we even attribute our problems to the devil. And this bad devil gets blamed for more things than he should be blamed for. Do you know that? We blame the devil for so many things that he's not responsible for. But when we do that... <coughs> Many times as Christians, what that does is it shifts the blame from us. But isn't that typical human nature? Adam said, it's the woman. I told you, you blame the wife. It's the woman you gave me. She said, no, it's the devil. Well, he was responsible indeed. Right? Well, not completely. She made a decision and Adam, Adam agreed with her. You see, and sometimes what happens is that we wage spiritual warfare in this matter 
when it's not spiritual warfare that should be waged. So we need to be aware of how we can win this battle. So first of all, Paul says this, walk by the Spirit. He says, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. He says, conduct. What does it mean to walk by the Spirit? Does it mean you're walking around and... <laughs> and he's speaking in tongues or Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You're at work or, 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 or school or have this pious look on your face and your eyes are half closed and you're mumbling, mumbling, mumbling. You're praying in the spirit. What does it mean walk by the spirit? It means to conduct yourself by the dictates of God's Holy Spirit. It means to follow the promptings of the Spirit of God in your heart. It means that when the Spirit of God has spoken to you about something, has convicted you about something, you need to act upon that. It needs to live by the Spirit, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. You see, our natural tendency is to sin. Isn't that so? That's the natural human tendency. And the Holy Spirit, by his power, will enable us to win this struggle, this fight against sin. When we live by the Holy Spirit, when we're walking close to the Holy Spirit and we're listening to him, we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we need to be fed by the Holy Spirit, and we need to be led by the Holy Spirit. You cannot be led by the Holy Spirit unless you're being fed by the Holy Spirit. How are you fed by the Holy Spirit? Well, you're in church. Great. That's one way. By praying and spending time with God in his word and praying every single day. So, <clears throat> Paul goes on now to state explicitly for us what he means by the works of the flesh. So he goes on. He says, look, verse 17, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. So if you ever wonder as a Christian, there is always this battle inside of you. You are not weird. You might say, but brother, so-and-so doesn't tell me about this. But sister, so-and-so doesn't seem to have this battle. Listen to me. Everyone does. Everyone has this battle. And some are winning and some are fighting and they're losing. Some are naive. And they've been misled by the enemy. But the earlier our eyes open up to this. And understand this battle, you know, have an understanding of it, I think it is easier for us to win. The desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. These are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. So every one of us, we've got this battle within raging. And this battle is going to continue until you die. No one can say, well, you know, when I got saved... I, I had this struggle with sin, and then after about a year or two, it was over. No. You see, there are many fights outside in society, isn't that so? Among nations, among people groups, political parties, and all that stuff. So many, many fightings out there. And I think maybe the reason that we've got so much external conflict in the society is that we have not managed the internal conflict within and some people who cause the most trouble, they're always, always on edge, always ready to pick a fight, pick, a, pick some battle, they're always in trouble, are people who have a struggle on the inside. They're not at peace in their hearts, so they're causing a lot of trouble on the outside. Isn't that so? Yeah. Um, there are things that you may want to do in life, good things that you want to do, and you're not going to be able to achieve those things unless you win the battle within you. There are good things you may want to fight for out there. But you cannot win the battle out there unless you win the battle in here. Amen. So we've got to, and the thing is that no one knows. We can't tell the battle raging by the look on your face. Because people can mask it. People can mask it. So just in case we're puzzled now about this battle, about and this, the works of the flesh, and we're, we're ambiguous, what is he talking about? He goes on. He says, okay, let me explain to you what the works of the flesh are. Verse 19, he says, now the works of the flesh 
are evident. He says, you don't need to wonder. You don't need to ponder. You don't need to go to Bible school and university to study this. He says this, I'm going to tell it to you here. It's quite evident. First of all, he says, sexual immorality. He starts off with the most obvious, probably the epitome of the works of the flesh. Sexual immorality. An area of the most prevalent weakness. Now, God made man and woman, and he designed the sexual experience with all its pleasure. Now, many times in the church, we've got a theology of God, theology of man, theology of sin, theology of the Holy Spirit, theology of eschatology, the end times, um, theology of the devil, demonology. We've got theology of so many things. You know there's a theology of sex too? And we don't have that one right. You might say, and I know this, this sounds taboo, but I need to clear something up here, especially for the younger ones. God is not anti-sex. Are you following me here today? Mm -hmm. He's not. So people have grown up in the church, and they have this feeling that sex is dirty. It's evil. It's wicked. And they forget who made it. It wasn't the devil that made it. God. And we, we treat this topic as taboo. And we don't talk about it. So the young people in the church and the kids, they hear about sex all the time in the world. And they come to church. Not, it's not mentioned. It's not mentioned. Everything in the world is sexualized. Isn't that so? Every advertisement is sexualized. God knows the power of sex. So that's why he made boundaries for it. And he says sex must be within the confines of marriage. And the biblical definition of marriage is between one man and one woman. One man and one woman until death us do part. Are you following me here today? Amen. Impurity is sex, sexual morality is being seen as dirty or filthy. Then we have sensuality, which is indulgence and sensual pleasure unrestrained by convention or even by our standards of morality. Sensuality. Sex, drugs, Partying, all those sort of stuff. So the first thing he talks about is sexual immorality. The second one he talks about is demonic activity. Idolatry. Sorcery. Let's talk about that. You see, there are millions of people, maybe billions in the world, who worship idols today. Isn't that so? Mm -hmm. Huge idols. Idols, by the time you enter into the yard. Idols. Maybe when they enter the door, they have a place where they pray. They have idols and so on. Countries in the world where they've got idols, so many idols. And they are deliberately disobeying the first two commands that God gave us. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Isn't that so? Mm -hmm. The second one was this, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. God says, no idols. Because no idol can compare to the majesty and the glory of Almighty God. An idol makes a mockery of the one true God. Just in case we didn't know. It's a mockery. It's an abomination to God when people are in idolatry. Because God is spirit, he's not matter. God cast aside his ancient people, Israel. They were sent into exile because of their abominable idolatry. God says, how dare you make an idol? How dare you fall down and worship an idol? As if that idol made you, that idol blessed you, that idol kept you. Isaiah said, you know, they have a tree, and they cut the tree. 
Half of the tree they had taken, they would carve out into an idol. And half the tree, they would chop it up and make firewood. Then they would put it there and warm themselves by the fire. Half is for fire to make himself warm, and half you worship. What sense does that make? Satan laughs, I think. Satan throws a party when human beings of sound mind and reason can worship a mere idol. Yes, I've got them. I've got them. Then Paul goes on, he says, idolatry and sorcery. Sorcery, you see, when people get into idolatry, it opens the door for any other kind of demonic activity. Sorcery, dabbling in witchcraft, in black magic, in the occult, seeking spiritual power apart from God. And you've got it in the West also. People are looking for spiritual power, but they don't want to come to the true and the living God. They don't want to hear about the name of Jesus. And they're, they're thinking that, well, here you've got the power of God on one side. You've got light and you've got darkness. But they're actually the same. It's just one's different from the other. No, it's not. One's of God and anything that is not of God is of the devil. It's not just another source of power. It is a demonic source of power. Today we've got the psychics. I hope as Christians you don't go to the psychic. And they're popping up everywhere, right? And it's, it seems so, ben so benevolent, so benign, you know? Nothing's wrong. Just go. Um, have your palm read. Palm reading, tarot cards, and, you know, all this stuff. People are dabbling in, um, with the enemy. Then we've got interpersonal conflict. Sexual, um, sexual immorality, idolatry, and, and demonic activity. Interpersonal conflict. This is another work of the flesh. He says enmity, enmity, strife, fits of anger, <laughs> rivalries, dissensions, divisions. Do you know there's some people like that? There are people who are out in society who are agitators, promoting division, promoting strife, promoting envy, promoting you know, demonizing one group of people. Are you hearing me? There are people, don't you fall to that. Come on. Don't you fall to that. When we give in to our fleshly tendencies, we tend to always be fighting, quarreling. You're unsatisfied. You, you're hard to please. You cannot negotiate. You cannot compromise. You always want to have your own way. Why do you think so many marriages are, are breaking up? Because neither one wants to compromise, wants to negotiate. It's my way or the highway. There are people like that. They cannot be appeased. And that was what Paul says is going to happen in the last days. They're unappeasable. Unappeasable. Aren't there people like that today? You can't negotiate with them. That's the work of the flesh. Angry. Always seeking to win, always seeking to dominate, and they're causing strife and contention and division. It is sad when you've got someone like that to feel to deal with in a family, isn't that so? Or a spouse. Anyone got a, a spouse like that? Or someone in the family? Or a relative? Or in your workplace? <laughs> you're laughing because you probably know some people like that, right? But there are. Unfortunately, in life, we've got people like that. They can't sit and have a reasonable conversation. Before you say to what they're, they're on already. You know? Interpersonal conflict. Again, let me say enmity, strife, fits of anger. They're easily angered. Looking out only for to compete rivalry, dissensions, and divisions. And wherever they are, they're causing. They're not, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the children of God. And finally, he says, the party lifestyle. Envy, he says, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. That's what Paul said. He said, and I warn you, 
Okay, I'm going to come to that later on. Drunkenness. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about drunkenness, doesn't it? We see alcohol as LCBO makes a lot of money, even in COVID, right? <laughs> a lot of money. Alcohol sells, and so many people are imbibing and, and getting drunk. The Bible tells us wine is a mucker, strong drink a brawler. Whoever is led astray by it is not wise. The Bible tells us be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. An orgy is a party in which people behave in a very uncontrolled way. And it's especially one that is involving sexual activity. And you can have like a drunken orgy also. There's revelry and carousing. It's this hedonistic lifestyle. Let's just party, you know. You know, I hear some Christians who talk about clubbing, you know, fetting. Go to a Saturday night uh, disco and you're dancing and imbibing and, and all these things. And you want to come to church on a Sunday and, and worship God. Just in case you're getting things mixed up, maybe go back and read this passage again. Those are the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh. And then he goes on to make a stunning statement. Listen to what Paul, the apostle, says. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I'll say that again. Those who do such things, Paul says, will not inherit the kingdom of God. But I thought we were saved by grace. It's the effect. It's all by grace. Yes. It doesn't matter how I live my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank God for his grace. Amen. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. <laughs> how dare Paul say this? Mm -hmm. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, there may be some people who want to take that chance, you know. And I don't know whether that's a good idea. Please be warned. Please be warned. And this is what we call the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Who are the Nicolaitans? Well, actually, as we're studying Acts chapter, uh, book of Acts, Nicholas was one of the, um, the, the, the seven, right, who was called to serve tables. And it is thought that, well, he eventually drifted away and went into apostasy, and in Revelation 2.15, this is what the writer says, so also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Nicholas led the church astray. This is not jolly old St. Nicholas, right? This is a different Nicholas. He led the church astray into immorality and wickedness. And Clement of Alexander says this about the Nicolaitans. They abandoned themselves to pleasure like goats. I don't know how much pleasure goats have, but this is what he said, <laughs> right? Leading a life of self-indulgence, right? They abandoned themselves to pleasure, and they led a life of self-indulgence. And, and Jesus was rebuking the church for following after the ways of the Nicolaitans. Their teaching perverted grace and replaced liberty with license. And even Paul himself Address this. In Galatians 5.13, this is what he said. For you were called to freedom. We're free, you see. You, you see there, Pastor Michael, it says we're free. We're free. He says, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. So there is a limit to our freedom. It's not so. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. And then he goes on to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. So he spoke about the war. He talks about one side of the flesh. Sexual immorality, drunkenness, or, and all these things. Anger and so on. Now he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Now notice he doesn't say the work of the Spirit. Or the works of the Spirit. He says what? The fruit of the Spirit. All right, so why does he use that word? Because when the Holy Spirit is inside of us, right, it's not something that you put on. It's something that comes naturally. It's a fruit. And fruits come 
naturally. You don't, that's what I heard Charles Stanley say this one time. He says, you know, I don't like to preach and teach about the fruit of the spirit. Because when I talk about, I, I think when I talk about it, people will want to start putting these things on. And he says it's not that. They should come naturally. And he has a point. But we must be aware so that we can identify the fruit of the spirit. Yeah. All right? He says, um, this fruit is, fruit that you bear is based on the life that is flowing out of you. So he says in 522, the fruit of the spirit is love. Number one, isn't that so? Yeah. Love. Not hatred. Not anger, not enmity and strife and dissension and division. Quite the opposite. It's love. Loving people regardless, you know, of the color of their skin, their educational status, the opinions they hold and all these things. Still loving and respecting people. Can I get an amen? Amen. Love. Not hatred, not malice, not bitterness. The Bible tells us that the love of God is what? Poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit that is given unto us. When the Spirit of God comes in you, he fills your heart with love. With an overflowing love. Then he says joy. Joy. Not being grumpy. You know somebody always grumpy? Mm -hmm. Satan wants everybody to be grumpy. But Jesus wants everyone to be happy. He gives you joy. Not being grumpy, not being moody, sour-faced. Huh? You come to church and, you know, oh, you're so pious, you're so righteous, you know, that uh, <laughs> we can't smile and we can't laugh. Listen, I believe in the house of God we should just relax. Amen? Amen. Amen. Put a smile on your face. Mm -hmm. Let the joy show you want to laugh, laugh. The, make yourself comfortable. It's not a place to be straight-jacket and... Oh, I mustn't sing too loud. I can't do this. Or. The Bible tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. And in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. Next, he says there's peace. So there, there are the three big ones. Love, joy, and peace. Right? How many people in the world are longing for that? Some people want to go and sit under a guru to give them peace. Or do some chanting and meditation and all these things. I want peace. I want peace. If you need peace, just come to the Prince of Peace. Amen. He says, my peace I give you. My peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives, I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Peace. So many people in the world are searching for these emotions. They represent the epitome of our mental well-being. Peace, joy, and love. You know, they're so, they come even to the office, to the doctors and say, Get, you know, I'm so troubled in, within, you know, if I can only have peace. And it's such a treasure for them if they can have that. You've got money in the bank, but you don't have peace. Listen, those of you who have a home, not be a house, may just be an apartment building, even a basement apartment, whatever it is, and you've got peace in your home, Thank God for that. Amen. Thank God for that. You don't know how some people are, are living today. They don't want to go into their home. They don't want to get to that. They dread opening that door and going in again. It's like a hell in there. A dad maybe who's an alcoholic or somebody's on drugs or they're just fighting all the time. Thank God for peace. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit brings us to it. Then he says patience. Something we can all learn, isn't that so? Mm -hmm. Just to be patient. Mm -hmm. So when you go to the grocery store now, mm. and you see all the lines there, do you know, do you see how your eyes dodge <laughs> one line <laughs> to the next? See, which one is the shortest? <laughs> oh, she's taking too long there, that, you know, she's checking out, she's too slow. Um, something we can all learn, you know, we live in a world where business and rush seem to be a virtue, and it's causing so much stress. So many people are stressed. You know why people are stressed? Because they're in such a hurry. Some of you say, hurry up and take your time. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't tell a tree grow faster, can you? The tree just takes its time and it grows and bears its fruit. Then he talks about kindness and goodness. Kindness and goodness, acts of kindness. What's the key difference between the two? Well, kindness involves being generous 
and considerate and helping others. Goodness is that it involves righteousness in your, in your action, doing what is right. It's like a, a moral standard, a quality, right? Kindness actually involves someone doing something. It's seen. It's visible. And we should always be kind and, and good to people. That's what Jesus expects of us. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Then he says faithfulness. What is faithfulness? It means to remain loyal, remain steadfast in the good times and in the bad times. So we need faithfulness for the marriage. Isn't that so? All the time. You know, it's wonderful to have faithful friends. Isn't that so? Man, you can just pick up the phone, you can call him, or when you gather together, you sit down, and you just have a great time together. Yeah. It's good to have faithful friends. Yeah. They have your back, yeah. you know. If you say something or they do something, you know, you get into a little bit of a, a tiff there, you can always start it out and you go on again. Amen. But friends who separate are if a little bit of a problem, those are not real friends. Yeah. Come on. They stick regardless. It's good to have a faithful spouse. Amen. Thank God for the faithful spouses. Amen. All right. You're committed until death. And then it's good to have faithful people in the church also. Amen. Oh, I love this church. <laughs> We've got faithful people. Amen. And Pastor Sam will tell you how much he would appreciate people who are faithful. That's one of the things that leaders look for, faithfulness. You know, and sometimes we've got people in this. In, there's a tendency in the world, you know, sometimes in the, in the um today that, well, you know, people have a bit of an issue in the church and, okay. So long, bye-bye. <laughs> They're gone, you know. You said something I didn't like or someone did something I didn't like. How are you going to ever grow with something like that? you got to learn how to deal with people of different backgrounds, you know, people say things differently or different opinions. That's life. I think that's the reason why God gave us a church. Mm -hmm. To kind of, all the edges we've got, <laughs> to kind of round us off and make us whole. Isn't that so, Sister Marie? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Help you to deal with every kind of people, you know. Because he knows some of us are single and some of us are living alone. So we don't, nobody's bothering us. I said, okay, you want to follow me? You want to be in my kingdom? Get into a local church. <laughs> and when you interact with them, then you're going to see some problems you've got. Not what they've got. Problems <laughs> you've got. <laughs> <laughs> Am I talking? <laughs> it's easy to shout Jesus and to sing. It's another thing for this thing to live out from us and to get down into these deep issues. And that's why you see people don't want to go to church. And they don't want to belong to a church. Because I'm just going to live my life my way, brother. They're serving a different God, not the God of this Bible. Mm -hmm. Because the God of this Bible never said you can be a standalone Christian mm -hmm. and pastor yourself. Mm -hmm. So he says this, he says that faithfulness, then he says gentleness. Everybody say gentleness. gentleness. I love that one. Gentleness, self-control. He says against such things there is no law. What is, what is gentle? It's the quality of being kind, being tender, mild-mannered, softness of action or of effect. Taking it easy on people. People need us to do that today, isn't that so? Amen. Take it easy with them. Imagine you've got a newborn baby, right? Now Gary is holding his baby for a while, for a few weeks, he's getting used to it. But I'm sure the first time you held that baby, Gary, you were scared. <laughs> I'm afraid it's gonna break. You know? You're so, so tender, so, so soft, so small, you know? You, you, you want to make sure you don't break this baby. You don't hurt this baby. You clean them, make sure you, you, you take your time. You don't cause any kind of abrasions or anything like that, you know? So being gentle. Th th when I think about gentleness, that's what I think about. Um, you don't want to be rough. You don't want to be harsh. You, you want to be polite. When you're dealing with people, politeness is good, not being rough. There's some people who are just rude and arrogant that they think, oh, well, I'm just showing them who I am. Mm. But that's not of God. That's of the flesh. That's of the world. 
Amen? Amen. That's not of God. If you bully your way around or you're arrogant and you're just, you know, loud and I'm showing them who's boss here. No, 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 no. Handling people, listen, you know, you, sometimes when you open some boxes, you, you see this handle with care? Huh? Well, when you see people, handle with care. Handle with care. Amen. Or let's wrap it up. And it says self-control. Taking responsibility. Control yourself and have some boundaries in your life. Manage your appetite. Okay. No one said that. <laughs> Manage your time. Manage your entertainment. Your viewing habits. Your gaming habits. Your work habits. Some people work too much. Maybe not too many. Anyways. Some people eat too much. Mm -hmm. Some people are on Netflix too much. Mm -hmm. Or they're playing games too much. They just do so much. Have self-control, the Bible says. Um, God's plan is not for something to control you, but for you to be in control of your life. Right. You know, God doesn't want to control you like a robot. He doesn't. But many of us are under the control of different things. People are under control of tobacco, alcohol, marijuana, Gambling. cocaine. Gambling is another one. Pornography. Benzos. He says, and then Paul says this. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have what? Crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. It's, it's, it's a desire. It's a passion inside of you. So that you crave after. He says, but when you decide to follow Jesus, you crucify the flesh. Now listen, we do not bind and cast out the flesh. We do not take authority over the flesh. The flesh has to be crucified. Now, this is not a teaching session today. Probably it is. But um, <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question. How, tell me one way in which you know you can crucify the flesh. Not giving into it. Giving into it. Going on a diet, if, if that's eating is a problem. <laughs> How can we crucify the flesh? <laughs> Using the word? I think there's one answer. Um, one thing we can do, fasting. Because when you're fasting, you're denying the flesh. Isn't that so? And you're bringing the flesh under subjection. So fasting is one way of bringing the flesh in subjection to you. Okay. Now... So we are constantly in the battle. So Paul says we need to put off the old man. Remember Ephesians? Put off the old man and put on the new man. Put on the new man. And he says, I die daily. Die to the old man. You must have heard preachers who talk about putting, they wake up in the morning and they put on the armor of God. Isn't that so? The shield of faith, breastplate of righteousness, this and that and the other. Now, I don't know if we should ever put off the armor. Right? Anyways. But I know one thing that we need to put on. That's the new man. And we need to put off the old man. Every day in our lives. You see, when you put on the armor of God, that is taking care of the enemy on the outside. Unless you got a devil inside, but you don't. When you put on the armor of God, breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, shield of faith, and so on, you are taking care of the enemy on the outside. When you crucify the flesh, you're taking care of the enemy on the inside, the flesh. All right. So the task of crucifying the flesh belongs to us, not to anyone else. You can't pray about it. You can't ask God to do it. God says, why are you asking me to do what I'm telling you you need to do? Lord, help me to forgive so and so. God says, you ain't got to pray about that. You forgive them. You can't bind it. Can't, it must be crucified. So one is ways to strengthen our ability to crucify the flesh. I said it's by fasting. So here we go. The Bible says the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. None of us are exempt. We must all be aware of this struggle. And we must try to win this battle. You can either win or lose. But losing this battle can be spiritually detrimental to you. So let me ask you a question today. Are you winning this battle? That's what the Bible says. He who overcomes, we don't use that word a lot. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. 
God wants us to be overcomers. Now, he will never ask us to be overcomers if there was nothing to overcome. So God says, I want you to win this battle of the flesh versus the spirit. Overcome the flesh. Crucify the flesh. Let's all stand together, please. So what do we do? The task is for us, beloved, is to identify the areas in our lives where the flesh is dominating. And begin to work on crucifying it. Amen? Amen? We've got some work to do. We will always have work to do until we die. You know? So we need to take care of those things. The Bible says, do not um, walk according to the flesh, but live by the Spirit. Amen. Amen. 